Um, good morning and welcome to the Institute for Government. My name is Nick Davies and I'm a program director here. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for this discussion on how to fix uh, government outsourcing, which has been kindly supported by Gowling WLG. Uh, the Institute has a long-standing interest in government contracting and following the collapse of Carillion, we launched a new programme of work in this area. Uh, so in December, we published a report uh, providing a comprehensive analysis of government procurement, how much it spends, uh, what it buys and who it buys from. Uh, and yesterday, we published our second report in the series, uh, which looks at where outsourcing has succeeded, where it hasn't succeeded, uh, and what needs reform. Uh, and I will shortly be handing over to my colleague, Tom Sass, who will be running through the, the key findings from that report. Um, after Tom, we'll have um, responses from our panellists. Uh, so first up will be uh, Sir David Liddington, who is the MP for Aylesbury, and um, up until July was the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and the Minister of the Cabinet Office, in which role he oversaw the government's response to the collapse of Carillion and the publication of the Outsourcing Playbook. Um, following that, we'll have Rachel Reeves, the MP for Leeds West. Um, Rachel's held a number of French front bench positions, including Shadow Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, and since 2017 has been chair of the uh, Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Committee, uh, which last year published a very comprehensive report on the collapse of Carillion. Uh, and finally, um, we will have um, Richard Cockett, who is the author of seven books and uh, since 1999 has worked at The Economist, uh, where he is now global news editor um, and until recently um, led their coverage of UK outsourcing. Um, so I would recommend to everyone in the room today and um, watching live on the live stream to tweet using the hashtag IFG outsourcing. Um, before I hand over to Tom, I'd just like to quickly welcome uh, Robert Breedham from Gowling WLG uh, to make a few introductory remarks. It's very much, and now a word from the sponsors, isn't it? Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, to add to Nick's welcome, it's delighted to see you all here. I'm Robert Breeden. I'm a partner in the outsourcing team at Gowling WLG. For those of you who don't know Gowling, Gowling is an international law firm. Um, you won't be surprised to hear that we have a number of um, corporate clients in the private sector, but importantly for today's purposes, we're one of 12 firms who act for the UK government in terms of its legal support, which sees us currently advising on a number of significant central government outsourcing projects. And so we are both interested and experienced in the sector. Um, the uh, Institute for Government's previous report that Nick has mentioned just drew out the scale of outsourcing in the UK. Um, nearly £300 billion is spent by the UK government on procuring various goods, works and services from the private sector. So it's hugely important. Um, and so it's, it's of um, importance to us all that the, that the extent of that outsourcing works. And it's right, isn't it, that in recent years that has come under increased scrutiny with a number of difficult uh, areas and indeed high profile failures uh, around the outsourcing model. So that increased scrutiny is absolutely right. But it's, I think, also fair to say that sometimes some of the commentary around those failures is made necessarily without um, too much reliance on an understanding of the underlying facts or the issues or indeed um, based on any evidence. So at Gowling, we welcome um, uh, in, um, reports such as that launched yesterday, which seeks to provide us with a greater understanding of the issues surrounding government outsourcing. And I think it's important for us all who work um, in government, for government, or who receive public services to be confident that government understands what has worked well, what hasn't worked well, and where can we learn the lessons from that. And yesterday's report seeks to do that. And uh, as Tom will explain, it looks into a number of different sectors and starts to draw out some of the lessons that we might learn. And I think if we all take time to understand the underlying issues and themes, then perhaps we can be a little bit more optimistic than might otherwise have been the case about the future of outsourcing. Thank you. Tom. Thank you, Nick. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, so the way government contract services uh, really matters to the public. 
whether it's collecting bins, cooking meals in schools, assessing benefits claims, training the unemployed, carrying out routine NHS operations, or running prisons. Uh, private and voluntary providers have come to play a really important role in people's lives. Uh, it's a topic we at the Institute have worked on for many years, and it's one we've returned to in light of the collapse of Carillion, a string of high-profile contract failures, and renewed political debate over public and private uh, provision. That debate is indeed a fierce one, and there are good principled arguments on both sides. Uh, yet it's a debate that often has generated more heat than light, uh, and has obscured a more basic set of questions. Where has outsourcing worked, delivering better outcomes to the public? And where hasn't it worked, leading to services that were poor or unreliable? And what factors explain success or failure? So those were the questions we set out to answer uh, in this report, which I'll briefly run through today. I'll, I'll start with some quick history there. So over the last 40 years, out, outsourcing has transformed the way many public services are delivered. Uh, in the late 1970s, each of the services I just mentioned and many others were delivered in almost entirely by the state. Thatcher's reforms really set the ball rolling, uh, but every government since has expanded the role of private providers. So the chart behind me shows the expansion of procurement spending between 1987 and 2017. Uh, because of the way that the data is collected, this includes goods like paper clips and works like construction projects, uh, which fall outside our definition of outsourcing, which focuses on the delivery of services. Uh, but it gives you a sense of the growth of the private sector's role over this period. And we are talking largely here about the private sector. Voluntary providers account for just 4% of this procurement spending. Uh, so starting with cleaning, catering and waste collection, private companies soon took on more complex services. The first private prison was opened in 1992, and large IT, IT projects soon followed. New Labour, elected in 1997, you can see in the red there, um, accelerated the expansion of the role of the private sector, and in particular by increasing the use of private financing. Uh, the coalition went further still, opening new markets in areas like probation, and the UK was often a pioneer. The wider context, of course, changed. New Labour increased overall public spending while the coalition sharply reduced it. Uh, but successive governments had a largely consistent rationale that applying competition and private sector expertise to the work of government could reduce costs, raise quality, encourage innovation, and perfor improve performance across the wider public sector. But has outsourcing met those aims? So we looked at 11 service areas, which are on the slide behind me. Uh, for each, we reviewed the quantitative uh, academic evidence as well as case studies of individual contracts. Now, green means consistent evidence of the, be of the benefits I just mentioned. Uh, amber means the evidence is mixed. And red means evidence of cost increases or lower quality or performance. So we judged that outsourcing has worked best in waste collection, cleaning, catering, and maintenance. When these services were first outsourced in the 1980s and 90s, Private companies made large savings, often around 20% of annual operating costs, mostly while maintaining levels of quality. They improved efficiency, partly by paying staff less, but also by improving management and benefiting from structural advantages such as economies of scale. The picture for uh, complex frontline services is more mixed. Uh, private prisons have in introduced innovations, which public prisons have adopted. Uh, including new technologies like in-cell phones and changes to the way that staff treat prisoners. While they appear to perform worse in some areas, like levels of order, introducing competition has, on balance, helped raise standards across the prison sector. In health, we found a real lack of comparable data between the public and, and private sector provision. Uh, in some cases, outsourcing health services appears to have improved performance in public hospitals but in others, such as Hinchingbrook Hospital and out of hours GP services in Cornwall, it's led to damaging failures. Private financing of construction has cost more while delivering limited benefits. Keeping costs off balance sheet, often the motivation, was a poor one, and government's decision in the 2018 budget to move away from PFI appears sensible. In probation, which I'll come back to, outsourcing has failed on every measure, leading to poor quality and unreliable services harming ex-offenders trying to rebuild their lives. Over time, the public sector has become more efficient in many areas, reducing or wiping out completely the advantage of the private sector. 
So we found no evidence that outsourcing can still deliver the 20% to 30% savings that it did in the 80s and 90s. And indeed, it's damaging for government to think that it still can. Where more recent studies show savings, they tend to be of around 5 to 10%. However, in many services, we were surprised by the lack of recent evidence. That in prisons and waste collection, there haven't been robust studies of cost and quality conducted since the late 1990s. So this means that government really is unable to base current decision-making on the evidence that it needs. This narrowing gap between public and private provision has added to calls uh, for services to be brought back in-house. But it does not mean that outsourcing has not worked. Early savings have effectively been banked, and competition has been a key driver of improving public sector efficiency. So in areas where outsourcing has worked, removing competition by returning services to government hands entirely would therefore be risky. As well as looking at where outsourcing has worked and where it hasn't, we also looked at why projects succeeded or failed and identified several common causes of failure. So first, we found that contracts failed when the initial decision to outsource in the first place was wrong. In the case of probation, there was no market of adequate suppliers, it was difficult to measure supplier performance, and the Ministry of Justice proved unable to define an adequate level of quality in the contract. At the time, many warned that it wouldn't work, including the IFG. Six years on, Dame Glenna Stacey, Chief Inspector of Probation, said of the failure, uh, probation is a complex social service and it has proved well nigh impossible to reduce probation services to a set of contractual requirements. We also found four other factors uh, in how government uh, goes about outsourcing which came up repeatedly in contracts which work less well and we illustrate these with examples in the report. So first, a lack of early engagement and insufficient understanding of the nature of the service being outsourced, which often leads to major problems in delivery. Second, a narrow focus on the lowest price bid uh, and not enough attention given to quality, which leads to low ball bidding, unreliable services, and actually a fundamental lack of trust in bidding processes. Third, the transfer of risks to the private sector that it has little control over and cannot manage well, such as risks around the level of demand for a service. That was a problem at Hinchingbrook. And fourth, weak contract management, meaning that contracts don't deliver the outcomes they should. So after 40 years of expansion, what next for outsourcing? What should government do to address the current problems? First, we think that government needs to get much better at deciding when to outsource. It should do so when there is a reason to think outsourcing can deliver genu genuine benefits to the public, for instance, when a company has expertise, new technologies, or economies of scale, and not as an article of faith or in pursuit of unrealistic savings. Second, it needs to improve the way it outsources to address problems with market engagement, bid selection, risk transfer, and contract management. So in February, when Sir David was in charge of the Cabinet Office, the government published its outsourcing playbook. Uh, we think this is a really excellent piece of work, and I'm not just saying that because David's the next speaker. Um, if it's fully implemented, it will be really transformative. The challenge that we identify is that some of the pro proposals in the playbook have been around for many years and have often been ignored. It's hard to change culture, which is deeply ingrained. Officials may not have the time, skills, or incentives to adopt best practices. Ministers will apply, apply pressure to push through unworkable plans as happened with probation. So we therefore make a range of recommendations, which you can read in full in the report, on what we think is needed to deliver change. Uh, these include suggestions on uh, how to further strengthen commercial skills and capabilities, how to beef up the approvals process so flawed projects don't get through, how to make ministers and officials more accountable to parliament and to the public, and how to improve the evidence base that informs outsourcing decisions. So we think it's vital that government takes this opportunity to reform outsourcing. Bringing swathes of services back into government hands by default risks throwing away the benefits that outsourcing can deliver. But public support for such a policy is likely to increase if government continues to suffer repeated failures. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Sir David. Thank you. Um, this issue um, sort of reminds me of two 
episodes in particular during my ministerial years. And the first was about a month into my term as Justice Secretary when my permanent secretary came to see me uh, for his regular weekly catch-up and, and, and broke the news that there were some serious problems over the probation model and uh, that the, there was a risk that at minimum a number of the uh, community rehabilitation companies would go under because they're, they were just not getting the return on which they had based all their assumptions when they uh, bid for and bid for and were awarded the contracts. And we, we then started the work on putting in place an emergency scheme uh, and then a, a sort of the thoughts on the replacement that, that then David Gork carried through. Um, at the Cabot office, I wasn't given the luxury of a month to think about it. Um, I got to the Cabot office on the 8th of January 2018 um, at about three o'clock in the afternoon. At five o'clock, John Manzoni, the chief executive of the civil service, put his head around my door, coughed. <coughs> Minister, I need to have a word with you about Carillion. Um, and basically came in with a couple of officials uh, an hour later and said, you know, they are on the verge of going bust. Um, you've got to take a decision about whether to bail them out. Um, and um, we're going to need to convene a COBRA tomorrow to test whether our um, cross-departmental contingency plans mean that we're able to cope with this and still keep services running. And any thought I had of an induction, <laughs> of meeting the staff in the first weeks, had blown out the window completely. Well, I, I will say, before I come on to, to Tom's report, was actually, I do think what Carillion showed um, was the civil service at its best in responding to that crisis because the, the, uh, the school meals were served, the hospitals were, were clean, and, and it was given the scale of, of the collapse. Um, I, I really do think the civil service rose magnificently to that challenge. Now, I very much welcome the report. Um, uh, I uh, very much agree with the thrust of it and with most of the uh, both both proposals and constructive criticisms that are in it. And I've, I've sort of tried when I look through it to sort of draw out five points that I'd sort of make to you today from my perspective. The first, it comes through strongly from what, what Tom writes, is the need for the outsourcing market to be broadened. Now, it's important we do think about the market sector by sector because there's some areas of construction where actually that there's quite a range of, of companies, perhaps some bigger issues about construction market more, more generally, but it's the, some of the complex um, facilities management uh, uh, challenges, uh, it's the provision of services where government is really the only um, customer, no, uh, prisons and uh, 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 probation being the obvious one where you suddenly find that you have a choice of very, very few companies indeed. And I think there's one case that you cite, Tom, where um, the department in question found that of the three preferred bidders, two dropped out. So basically, they were just left with the choice of one. Now, broadening the sector is important, therefore. And that, I think, is partly about um, being willing to look internationally, outside the box, and just see whether we've got some barriers against uh, 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 you know, good quality international providers coming in, but also it's about disaggregating some of the big con contracts and breaking those down. But we need to do that if we're going to do it with open eyes. If you break up big contracts into a larger number of small ones, you're going to need to have more civil servants to uh, manage and procure those contracts, and more civil servants obviously trained to the relevant level of expertise there. So there is a real issue over civil service um, staffing and skills. Uh, if we're going to go down that path, I think that path is important to broaden the market and also to give greater opportunities for not-for-profit companies, for SMEs and, and, and so on. Secondly, greater transparency, uh, I think, is in everybody's interest. Um, I think it was a fair criticism Tom made to say that a lot of the evidence which Whitehall has to hand about the benefits of outsourcing is a tad out of date. Uh, and I found this, and when I was sort of 
preparing evidence to give to Rachel so, uh, and, and, uh, and Frank Fields sort of sitting in select, joint select committee, um, and to Bernd Dinkins' committee as well. Um, and uh, I hope that the action is being followed through to do the sort of an analytical work that you've, you've called for there. I think it does need to be done. I think the focus on quality, not just on money saved, is important. Ironically, companies tend to complain that they make less out of uh, government these days than at the start, partly because the uh, skills of the civil service um, in, in terms of its functional management has itself improved. So they, they, they're not the, the easy rollover that they might have been thought to be at the start. Um, greater transparency also should include pilot projects. Um, I think that one of the things that went wrong with probation was that the changes came in as a big bang. There had been some small-scale pilot projects, social impact bonds at Peterborough Prison, for example, which did seem to be working reasonably well. And I think that particularly a new area, one should look at testing with, a, with pilot uh, schemes before going out to, to, to outsource on a large scale. Um, and I think that uh, there's also um, a, it's important that, we, that, that government really does follow through on publishing KPIs. Uh, and this takes to the, sort of the third point about the allocation of risk. It's fair. Uh, outsourcing companies need to know what they're taking on. Now, there's some risk. You know, if, gov if a government comes in and changes tax rates on business, well, frankly, whether you're out an outsourcing company or not, that's just a risk that you, you take. That's, that's politics, and you have to manage that in the way you, other ma you manage other business challenges. But I do think that government needs to be clearer about the risks that it believes that the contractor is going to take on in uh, taking on the contract. Um, and I think that um, greater transparency of information all around, I think, will help uh, to improve quality. One of the problems I found at Justice with prisons, for example, was that when it came to cleaning and repairing a prison, that actually the contractor, when they'd taken on the contract, didn't really appreciate how often prisoners smashed windows. Um, you know, if there was a, 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 a disturbance in a prison, a lot of windows would get smashed in a very short space of time, and they would need to be repaired, otherwise you'd get more disturbances. Uh, so, uh, and they just weren't aware, to the extent they should have been, about what they were taking on. So that has to change. Fourth, this is all going to involve a greater degree of centralization within government. You were very nice about the playbook. Thank you for that. Um, but you were right, too, that some departments are better than others at um, implementing those principles. And I think that it will be important that from number 10 and the Treasury, there is strong support for the Cabinet Office in insisting that certain basic ground rules are followed when it comes to outsourcing. And finally, that means that we do need to end what frankly has been a tacit conspiracy for far too long to do with the public spending round. And it isn't new. I mean, the three years I spent in the, the, the sort of very end of the Thatcher, beginning of the major governments working for Douglas Hurd, I can remember public spending rounds where, in the final horse trade, you know, uh, an assumption was made about inflation that was everybody knew was very unlikely to be delivered, but was needed to make the figures fit. And I think some of what we're seeing derives from a culture in public spending rounds where what the Treasury is interested in is getting the numbers to pan out department by department on a bilateral basis. And the spending department is willing to make a heroic assumption about the savings it can make to come to a settlement. And I do rather think that uh, the, some of the, the contracting companies themselves have been party to this and said, well, we can, we can manage this, yes, of course. And then two years, three de years down the line, uh, it, it, it risks going belly up because the, uh, the genuine uh, costs have not been uh, exposed at the start. And that does require a pretty big cultural change. And in my view, it means that Treasury, uh, and Liz, when she was at Treasury, was, was thinking in these terms, needs to focus on 
uh, the quality of spending as well as on the and on the outcomes of spending as well as on uh, the, just the, the numbers that are involved, the number of pounds that are being spent. Brilliant. Thank you. Rachel. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nick and Tom, very much. Welcome uh, your report. Um, I guess what David didn't know when um, he um, had to deal with Carillion that he was uh, going on to deal with even greater crises <laughs> and Carillion was a walk in the park compared to what you had to do on Brexit. Uh, um, my experience of all of this came from the inquiry that my select committee did into the collapse of um, at Carillion, and I was just uh, rereading the report on that um, yesterday ahead of coming to talk to you this morning. And the, the beginning of the summary um, reads Carillion's rise and spectacular fall was a story of recklessness, hubris, and greed. Its business model was a relentless dash for cash driven by acquisitions, rising debt, expansion into new markets, and exploitation of suppliers. It concludes the mystery is not that it collapsed, but that it lasted for so long. And if you look at what happens, happened at, at Carillion, I think it does have a wider readover to the story about outsourcing in, in public services. The implications of the collapse of Carillion were that um, many suppliers, I think around uh, 27,000, uh, um, no, 30,000 suppliers in total, were owed £2 billion when Carillion collapsed. Many of them had been waiting for payments for 120 days because although Carillion were a signatory to the prompt payment code, uh, they didn't abide by it. They had 43,000 employees. Um, almost instantaneously, around 2,000 of those lost their jobs. They left a pension liability of £2.6 billion, the biggest ever hit on the Pension Protection uh, Fund. 27,000 people will now be getting uh, less in retirement than they thought they would. Uh, and the government had to put in tens of millions of pounds to keep essential services um, running. Uh, Carillion um, recorded, uh, paid a, a record dividend of £79 million, and that was paid on the 10th of June 2017, uh, and of course just a few months later, just six months later, that company uh, went bust. Uh, its profit warning issued in September uh, 2017 um, of a billion pounds was um, equivalent to seven years' profits of the company. Uh, it was a facade. It was built on a, a false um, a premises and, I believe, false accounting. Um, who was responsible? It's easy to say, you know, the government should have done something. We say in the report that those culpable were the directors of the company, but all of the checks and balances that should have worked just didn't. So the non-executives were asleep at the wheel and weren't giving the challenge to the executives that are needed. The auditors, in the case of Carillion, KPMG, signed off for 19 years in a row the accounts of Carillion and never qualified them. Um, not once. Uh, and after the most recent dividend, after the most recent accounts uh, were, were published in 2017, in March 2017, just three months later, the company was issuing um, a huge uh, profit warning. Uh, helpfully, that was just a month after their largest ever dividend was paid uh, out. The regulators as well didn't do their job. I think our com um, committee concluded that the Financial Reporting Council and the Pensions Regulator were united in their feebleness and timidity. But also, the government's Crown representative was absent, uh, had left and wasn't reappointed for several months during some of the most crucial times. And the Crown representative was supposed to be the government's eyes and ears in the business to know what was going on. And the government didn't know um, what was going on. There's a wider issue as well, probably beyond the discussion today, about the corporate government's uh, framework. So what does this all tell us about government policy and, and outsourcing? I, I'm not claiming that every government do, every um, private company doing government outsourcing work is like uh, Carillion. Fortunately, uh, they are not. There were particular issues um, going on at Carillion, but I think there are some more systemic lessons that we can learn from the collapse of Carillion, and certainly that my committee and the other committees that looked into this at the time of its collapse 
felt needed to be better understood. One of them, Tom and, and David have already alluded to, is that you've got a small number of companies bidding for work. And during the 19 years of Carillion's existence, uh, they grew and grew, not through organic growth, but by buying uh, up and merging with other businesses. So by the time uh, it collapsed, there were many contracts that government put out to tender where Carillion were the only business tendering for it. Uh, and as a result, you didn't have real competition in the market, and the, 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 it wasn't being tested in, in a way that uh, you should do when government procures uh, services. Um, the government as well, I feel, and the committee felt, was agnostic about what was happening in the marketplace, and didn't um, uh, try and ensure that there were a, a decent number of people that could bid for the government um, work. There was also, and Tom talks about this in his report, a lack of accountability for the providers of what are public uh, services. And it was very difficult for the public uh, or select committees or, or others to hold to account in the way you would hold government to account uh, the private providers of public services. And I think more is needed, and again, uh, um, your r report uh, talks about incorporating into the um, freedom of information um, um, framework the companies who are providing these uh, services. I think there's also a wider issue about public service ethos and whether it matters, and I believe it does. And with the, the contracting out of, of public services, what was the, the focus and what was the ethos? Was the ethos about delivering for shareholders or was the ethos about delivering larger dividends and, and bonuses um, or was the ethos about delivering excellent public services? And I fear that the, um, the gradual creep into more and more services, particularly for those people uh, who, are, who, are, who are vulnerable, uh, does create an, an issue about who the service is there for and who uh, is going to be the ultimate beneficiary. Is it the people um, who, are, um, who, who are the recipients of that service? Uh, is it the taxpayers who pay um, for those services? Or is it the, um, the, the shareholders of the company who is delivering the service? And, and I think that we should be more concerned about those values of public service ethos, which I think have been lost through the um, encroachment of, of outsourcing into more and more parts of our public life. I think linked to that is the issue about where do these savings come from? And, and Tom is honest in the report, uh, a lot of the savings are delivered from paying staff less than they were paid when they were delivering the service in the public sector. Now, is that really a genuine efficiency saving uh, or is it just the, the transfer of, of income from one set of people to, uh, to uh, another? And uh, you know, the government have done a lot in the last few years to ensure that more and more workers, and local government as well, more and more workers directly employed by governments, local or, or central, are paid a living wage, that they have a decent uh, pension, that they have secure contracts. Those things don't exist in a lot of the outsourcing uh, companies. And as the outsourcing companies then subcontract more and more of those services, you have even less of a grip of whether p workers are being paid a, a real living wage, whether they can contribute to a decent pension scheme, or whether they have secure uh, contracts. And again, I think that's about this issue about public uh, service. There's also the issue of, of risk and where risk lies. And I think it does need to be much more clear when services are outsourced who is responsible for different risks. But the lesson of Carillion is that there are certain risks that you can never actually outsource. And so when Carillion collapsed, the government uh, couldn't say, I think the government were right not to bail out Carillion. That was the right decision by David uh, and his team. But the truth is, the government couldn't say, um, you know, well, Carillion has, has, has failed and, you know, we'll just let the market uh, pick up the pieces because you had essential public services that had to be delivered the next day. And so there are risks that you can't outsource, even for what we might consider some of the simplest services like school dinners and cleaning. They might be simple to outsource, but in the end you can't transfer all the risk when you outsource um, those services. So what needs to be um, done now? 
I think that there is a strong case for some of these services being brought back in house, uh, particularly in, in, uh, in probation, but uh, also I think in, in other parts of public service. I think there needs to be a more rigorous set of objectives, but I think most of all, we need to be much clearer about what we want public services to be and what we want them to deliver. And so there's been some really interesting work going on, particularly at a local authority level. For example, the community wealth building model in Preston that looks at sourcing much more services at a, a local level and ensuring that, uh, uh, that income and, and wealth stays in the local community. Uh, the University of Manchester, the uh, foundational economy collective there, have been looking at a model of social licensing. So where the private sector are involved in the delivery of public services, they sign up to a certain set of, of criteria around things like the living wage, around uh, uh, pensions, around paying your um, suppliers on time to ensure that some of those values that I think are really important, indeed essential in public services, are actually delivered, whether the public service is being delivered by the public sector or by an outsourcing company. And so I think that the, uh, the IFG work on this is very well timed because, as you say at the beginning of the report, um, outsourcing is at a crossroads. For those services that are still going to be outsourced, and there will still be very many public services uh, outsourced in the years to come, quite frankly, because the public sector doesn't have the expertise or the capacity to deliver all of these. But we need to ensure that when services are outsourced, that the, the, the focus on the people who are the recipients of those public services and those paying for those public services, the taxpayers, get value for money, but also a service that lives up to the public nature of that service that's being delivered. Thank you, Rachel. Richard. Um, thank you, Nick and, uh, and Tom, and to the IFG for producing an, an excellent report. You've heard most of what I was going to say already, so I'll um, keep it brief. Um, so um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things which I think are really important in, in, in this IFG report. Um, the, the first one is that the obvious rationale for outsourcing that led the Thatcher government reforms and then the successive governments to uh, increase outsourcing um, that has largely been eroded over time by sort of the very success of outsourcing. I, as we've heard, you know, outsourcing used to deliver 20% savings, etc. That age has gone. Um, and that's partly because, you know, those gains have already been captured over several generations of outsourcing. And also, as we've also heard, you know, public sector has got better at, at, at doing jobs um, that they might have lost to outsourcers a couple of generations ago. So in, in many ways, that sort of age has gone. So now we have to sort of think differently about it. And one conclusion from that is that um, outsourcers have to be better um, in terms of quality. They can't just sort of claim that they're saving a lot of money anymore um, because that's much harder to do now. And for writing about this for The Economist over, over, over the years, you know, we've done a lot of international comparisons on this. And that, that, is, that is true all around the world now. So this is not a British, it's not a UK phenomenon. That is true around the world. And if you go to all the comparative work done over sort of Germany, America, etc., um, Holland, um, where I think Holland now do even more outsourcing than Britain as a share of GDP. Um, they made much even bigger savings, 40%, 50% when they started these programs uh, 20 or 30 years ago. And once again, those savings have come down to uh, 10, 5% um, now. So this is a worldwide phenomenon and outs the outsourcing business will just have to get used to it and government will have to get used to it as well. So it's, it's a different age now. And that, I think, leads on to my second point, is that if we we'll continue with outsourcing, and I think the IFG uh, document makes a very compelling 
can compelling case of why we should continue with outsourcing. We have to be much more choosy and picky and selective about what we choose to outsource and what we don't. And I think what was also very clear from all the international evidence, and not just what the IFG have presented in this report, is the fact that over the years we now can see very clearly that outsourcing does some things very well and it does some things very badly. And broadly speaking, I mean, you saw their slide where they uh, gave you a kind of selection of, I think it was 10 services, and about half was sort of in the green area, and they were getting gradually more on amber and then very red for probation at the end. Again, that's a bit of a, that's an international story. It's not just a UK story, that all over the world, the lesson now, 40 years of outsourcing, is that, you know, for basic services which are easily quantifiable, you, you can get an exact measure of what constitutes a good service, outsourcing can be very good, productive uh, and efficient. But in complex services, usually um, involving human beings, um, like the probation services, it becomes very, very difficult because it's very, very hard to quantify or to set down on paper exactly the outcome that you want from delivering that service. And that's clearly the lesson of probation. Um, so, in other words, you know, I, I, I think um, governments and outsourcers, I mean, the lesson of probation is clearly that some services are probably less, uh, are probably best done still um, in house. And uh, that leads me on to the third thing is that I think it was racial ended, you know. Whether we like it or not, and whether you desperately want to stop outsourcing, I think those days are gone too, just because over the years, government capacity, and this is a worldwide story again in the UK or Europe, um, has shriveled over the past 20 or 30 years, partly because of austerity, but partly before. So, you know, the outsourcing capacity has to be maintained. So whether we like it or not, we have to do it better, and we have to make certain decisions about what should be outsourced, what should be not outsourced, um, because government ca capacity um, is no longer there. Um, two more points leading on from that. Um, I was astonished... Um, You've all alluded to this, but I was astonished writing about this uh, in Britain, not only Carillion, but the whole outsourcing sector, you know, how opaque the whole thing remains. I mean, it really is incredible, 40 years after um, this whole thing started, say, uh, dated from the mid-1980s, from the Thatcher regimes, um, how little we know about it and how in certain areas of this how little evidence um, there is, how little information we have about key uh, KPIs, um, for instance. Even the NAO is amazed at how little information they're given to work on often. And this makes the whole sector very opaque. And, you know, it's a warning for outsourcers. It's not surprising that a large numbers of the public politicians are highly suspicious of the outsourcing sector, and that it's very easy when Carillion get into trouble or InterServe get into trouble, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that, you know, they are the subject of sort of brick bats and, you know, they're all sort of greedy big companies, etc., because it's very hard to defend them, <laughs> even if you want to defend them, because we know so little often about what they do. So that's highlighted in the report. I, I would put that really at the top of things to fix, um, in the outsourcing sector, because it not only leads to inefficiency, because often, you know, governments and outsourcers, civil servants, you know, I've spoken to them, they are often operating in a fog of uncertainty and lack of, ev of evidence, however well-intentioned um, they may be. But it also presents, I think, a big political problem um, in that this is a very, very opaque sector, whereas in all aspects of government, everything is being driven towards greater transparency, greater uh, accountability, etc. You know, the outsourcing sector in many ways seems to live in, a, in another age, in a sort of Neanderthal age 50 years ago, where all this can be done um, secret. There's a little obligation often to, um, to, to publish much. Uh, they hide behind a cloak of commercial sensitivity, i.e. that they don't want to give too much informa information away in case that gives their competitors an advantage. Now, you know, uh, I've spoken to many of the outsourcing companies, 
about this. And in fact, on the whole, they probably agree, they, they often agree with me. They say, yes, we'd like to be more open, we should be more open, there should be obligations upon us um, to be more open. So I think, in many ways, that's sort of pushing it to an open door there. And, you know, the push should be much harder. And somehow all this should be made, you know, there should be much more in the public domain about this. Uh, local providers, national providers, um, you know, uh, uh, so I think that's a big problem and one that can uh, easily be resolved. I think there is will there, both on the part of government and on the part of the, of the providers um, to do that. So, uh, so that's my big thought on it. And just to conclude, um, you know, if we get more selective about this and how, and how we do this, I mean, I think it's great that um, local governments, more local governments now, even conservative councils are insourcing um, uh, services. Uh, there's a lot of insourcing going around, uh, going on at the moment in, in, in Tory councils as well as Labour councils for, say, road building, provision of, of, of social services, etc. And I, I, I regard that as a, as a good sign because that is for competition. You now have actually quite a healthy competitive market, not only between outsourcers themselves, but between um, public providers, if you like, local providers, local council providers, and outsourcers. So that'll force outsourcers to sharpen up their game, just as 40 years of outsourcing has forced local um, councils and, and, and central government to raise its game, often with, as you've heard, very impressive results. So I think that's good. And also, you know, I think it's very healthy, as Rachel says, that um, you know, there are now many different models um, of what we expect from outsourcing and, you know, what local councils can do with outsourcing. The Preston model, the Preston experiment, is, is leading the way in this in terms of how can you capture, for instance, more wealth and gain for the local community. You can write that into outsourcing contracts. Uh, and again, I think that's a good development. I don't think that has to negate. I don't see that as necessarily being anti-outsourcing or anti-private provision, but it's a way of taking the model on and taking the best of the original concept, i.e. trying to get gains from bringing in private sector expertise, but allying that to local concerns and more local needs and local demands for the new models of of, of how you operate and how you operate local services. So I, I, I want to end that um, on, on a positive note, and thanks again to the IFG for their very, very good report. Thank you. Uh, thank you also for mentioning insourcing because it allows me to say that that's what the next phase of our work is looking at. So if anyone here or watching has thoughts on insourcing and would like to talk to us, please do get in touch. Um, now I'm going to open up to questions from the audience. Before I do so, I'd quickly like to abuse my position of chair to ask David one question. Um, you made the point that the implementation of the playbook is going to require support from the Treasury and Number 10. Clearly, there's been a change of personnel. Uh, those personnel have rather a lot going on at the moment, and indeed your successor at the Cabinet Office has a specific role in relation to No Deal. What, is there a risk that implementation of the playbook loses momentum, do you think? Oh, th th there's, th th there's risk. Um, and I think that risk will be there, you know, irrespective of which party or parties were, were in government. It's, it's, you know, it's not... Uh, a sort of sexy, glamorous thing that, that captures the political headlines and which gets the number 10 press office uh, <laughs> excited, you know. Um, uh, I think that, but Oliver, in fact, Oliver Dowden is still in place, I think is very good news as he's very committed to this uh, reform agenda. Um, the big, t and, and, and I'm afraid it's, it's, it's a brutal truth that Brexit for the last year has been sucking out huge amounts of energy, attention, time and civil service resource right across Whitehall. So this area of policy is by no means the only one mm. that has suffered as a, as a consequence of that. Um, th I think the big test will be when we get to the uh, next um, triennial or quinquennial um, spending review settlement because that is the moment I think when we'll be able to see whether the centre of government uh, 
really it does see this uh, approach set out in the playbook and the recommendations that um, be made in, in, in Tom's report as a way of, of improving quality of service and not just um, trying to get you know, a, a, a one-off and sometimes fictional mm. cost saving. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to open it up for questions. Uh, can I ask that you keep the questions short uh, and that they are indeed questions uh, rather than statements? Um, and could you please say uh, your name and where you're from as well? And mics will come to you. So hands up. Who would like to ask a question? Okay, uh, lady here and then uh, two gentlemen here. Um, I'm Caroline Shepherd from the Traffic Penalty Tribunal. And um, I'm concerned in, in our area of outsourcing public duties and powers uh, as opposed to just services, and in particular in terms of enforcing and imposing penalties uh, in, our, in my jurisdiction on motorists, who then have to, uh, then the administrative justice is eroded because they're actually exercising their rights in a commercial against the commercial operators of these schemes, whereas upon there are regular there are administrative regulations which should be going to uh, tribunals and things like that. Has this been addressed in any of these studies um, about the powers and duties, and not simply services? Thank you. Uh, and then there was gentleman there, and then gentleman there in the pink shirt. Thank you. Uh, Charlie Gonnett from Shaw Trust. We're a charity who delivers some public services. Uh, I just would like to get your thoughts a bit more on the kind of dichotomy between, or the innate tension between picking more what is outsourced and the impact this could have on broadening the market. Uh, to give a very quick example, if you look at the employment support sector, the impact of insourcing more, maybe you lose that market. and We might not have the capacity to fulfill that, uh, to have that market there if it's needed, for example, if we went through a recession. Thank you. I'm uh, Alistair Smith, an economist, and for a few years I was chair of the Armed Forces Pay Review Body, and I want to ask a question arising from the outsourcing of Ministry of Defence Services. Uh, and in particular, ask the question whether we're right, learning the right lesson from private sector practice. There are a lot of outsourcing that goes on in the private sector. And one of the lessons of private sector resourcing, outsourcing is that private sector firms do not outsource their core activities. They outsource peripheral activities. But when we look at what's happened with the armed forces, uh, there have been a series of pretty disastrous outsourcing projects, of which the, the latest is the capita recruitment project, complete disaster. Yeah. What's happened there? Well, the armed forces have outsourced a core activity. The business of the armed forces is recruiting, feeding, looking after, training, managing large numbers of people. A private sector organization doesn't outsource its core activity. It's not a surprise if the army does it and it's a complete failure. Thank you. Uh, so we've got three really great questions there. So one on the outsourcing of duties and powers, not just services. Uh, one on the impact of outsourcing or insourcing on the, the market and the other on, on outsourcing core roles and responsibilities. Um, Tom, I might come to you quickly on that first one on duties and powers and the evidence. Sure. So it's one of the points we pick up in the report and actually in our earlier work on this, um, in a 2012 report, we said that actually where government is outsourcing key decision-making powers, um, that can often lead to failures. If the public doesn't have a clear recourse to or a, a way of appealing a decision that's been made by an external supplier. The example we give in the report is personal independence payment. Um, and that has, where actually a, a huge number of decisions were made incorrectly based on uh, the assessments made by private providers. And that has really sort of undermined the trust that, that people had in, in, in the work that do. DWP was doing um, in a really important area, you know, eligibility for benefits for dis disabled people. Uh, so the argument we make there is actually, if you are going to outsource a decision-making process, there are huge risks involved. You need to be really clear that actually there is a benefit to doing that. And secondly, you would need to make sure that the appeals mechanism for that process is really, really strong. Um, if you can't guarantee the quality of that decision-making, then you, you, you really shouldn't be outsourcing it at all. Thank you. Rachel, any of those questions you'd like to pick up on? Uh, just as from my experience when I was shadow work and uh, pension secretary in um, response to, to Charlie's um, question, um, 
I think one of the things we haven't discussed uh, fully today is about whether services should be procured at a local or a national level. And certainly when I was Shadow Work and Pension Secretary and I saw some of the big schemes that government were doing to get people back into work uh, and compared them with some of the local efforts that local authorities were making, often working with local uh, charities and community uh, centres and, and, and groups, I think there is this point about who is best to procure services. And I think, and I take David's point that you're going to have to have a lot more civil servants if you've got a lot more um, um, contracts. But I think there is something to be said for procuring services locally that might be closer in understanding the needs of a local community. The challenges of getting back to work in my constituency, where there are lots of jobs in Leeds, are very different, for example, in a, in a town where you have poor public transport infrastructure and industries that just don't exist anymore. So I think that, um, as well as this, this point about um, you know, who provides the services, I think there is the issue about who procures or, or provides. And, and just in response to, to, to Alistair's um, question, just something more generally about capita. Um, you know, capita were at risk of going the same way of, of Carillion. I think that they learned the lessons from uh, uh, Carillion and stopped paying uh, 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 dividends and did the, um, the, the, um, the, uh, the rights um, issue. Um, but the, the way that Capita are sorting out their finances is making further cuts to the services that they're providing uh, and that is likely to result in a further deterioration of some of these essential services that I think you're right in saying shouldn't have been outsourced in the first place. Richard? Yeah, I mean, just on the um, insourcing uh, question, yes, I mean, you know, if, if, there, if, if there is more insourcing, then, you know, of course, that means uh, perhaps an outside contractor or private contractor misses out. Um, but as I say, I regard it as, as healthy to have uh, a competition between what are now much improved insourcers and... Um, private providers, um, and, I, and I, the evidence seems to be that they have forced each to up their game, or certainly in the contractors that um, I've spoken to um, and those people who are, who are purchasing stuff from local authorities. And just on the local stuff, I think it's true, isn't it, that uh, local authority contracting as a whole is bigger than central government, isn't it? Uh, I, think I, think, I think the market... I thought it was slightly smaller. I think, yeah, I think it was slightly smaller. Slight, slightly more or smaller. Anyway, only slightly. So, I mean, this is, I, you know, this is a big market. I think a greater proportion of their spending is on outsourcing, but it's as smaller yes, as a but total it's than smaller central. Smaller as, as a total. Yeah. So, yeah. so, 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 you know, so this is a huge, this is a huge market. So, uh, you know, this is already happening that all these, that, that a lot of this decision making is local, and um, and I, I think that's a very, that's a, that's a very good thing. And in fact, and that's also partly been, you know, that that goes across um, councils, both Labour, uh, Lib Dem and, and Conservatives, so it looks like all, all you know, the local politicians have, um, have uh, reached the same conclusions. And just on capita, yeah, I mean, I would say about army contracting, yes, the famous um, recruitment fiasco. Um, I'd say, is that a core service as the army? I'd say fighting was probably the core service. But, um, the, but certainly I would classify that as one of those ones which we refer to for as a very complex um, contract dealing with, um, th with, with human beings. Um, how do you recruit people, entice people into uh, changing careers, into um, becoming soldiers, etc.? And... Uh, they clearly seem to have mismanaged that totally. And once again, it's one of those ones where, you know, the KPI seem to have been at fault here. Nobody could really get a handle on what looked like a good result or, or indeed a bad result. So I think that would go in my kind of red box up there with probation for uh, many of the same reasons. Thank you. Okay, and final comment from David, because we have sadly run out of time. I am running very quickly through on the first question. I agree very much with Tom about the... the necessity for a strong uh, and rapid appeal system. But don't let us uh, think that uh, just insourcing everything um, is going to produce the right result. And I can remember as a constituency MP um, wading through hundreds of cases at one time on child, child support agency 
stuff. When tax credits first came in, it's the same story, surgery after surgery. And some of this, and it's, it's true of the, the work capability assessments too, is about the difficulty of an essentially bureaucratic system, whether private or uh, government, coming to terms with people who are finding it difficult to balance the books you know, week by week in terms of their household income, who in many cases have different vulnerabilities and you know, don't have organized lifestyles um, for various reasons, and coming to terms with that when it interacts with a system that almost has to be bureaucratic and somewhat hierarchical. Um, or, I mean, with Alice's point about the MOD, again, um, yeah, I've, I've, there's certainly an MOD problem with um, uh, outsourcing, but there's an MOD problem with procurement full stop, which has been endemic for all the time I've been in politics. I remember 30 years ago sitting in the room while Margaret Thatcher tore strips off um, the MOD representative there because they were going way over their budget. And I think you talk to a Treasury Minister, Labour or Conservative, uh, of the last three decades or more, and you will find they all tore their hair out about the MO, MOD equipment budget and the fact it was, it was, it was never um, sticking within the figures that had been set. On, on Charlie's point about Shaw Trust, um, I, I, do, I do rather agree, actually, you know, the point about outsourcing is as much to keep everybody on their toes as, as, as it is to deliver specific savings. I do think some charities um, have got too hooked in the last 20 years on the sort of large contracts with local or national government, um, which has led to some structural and budgetary challenges for those charities when the contract has changed. Um, but I do think there will be, there needs to be a continuing important role for sure for other organisations, particularly when dealing with the sort of people I referred to earlier, who tend to mistrust anything that has OHMS stamped over it and who may need help outside office hours and during weekends and, and so on, mentoring. People who've got drug, alcohol, mental health problems, disabilities of various kinds. You need the state system in place, administered directly or through an outsource, but you also need to try to help those people by paying for that sort of more uh, flexible uh, uh, help that the, the third sector can provide. Thank you. Okay, with that, I'm afraid I'm going to have to bring it to a close. Um, thank you very much um, for attending today. Uh, thank you to Gowling WLG for supporting the event. And if I could ask you to all join me in thanking our four fantastic speakers.